Hi, welcome back to my channel. It's Emma and I'm here to do the mid-year book freakout book tag. Yeah. I debated whether I wanted to film this or not because I don't do a lot of book tags on my channel, but I just think this one is really cute and so it's so nice because you get to look back year to year and see kind of where you were at with your reading, what was your favorite and everything like that. So I would love to continuously continually do one every year. I don't think I was actually tagged to do this, but it, we're here anyway and it doesn't matter. So if you guys would like to also film the mid-year book freakout book tag, I'm gonna say it wrong for the whole duration of this video, please feel free to do it. Like I said, questions are down below and I'm just gonna jump right into it because um, I have a lot of livre to talk about, so let's get started. The coffee's really good this morning. All right, so the first question of this tag is what is your best book of 2020 that you've read so far? I think we all know what this is. It is 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I just, ah, uh, I absolutely loved it. I just, I don't even want to talk about it because I loved it too much. It's like one of those secret things in your life that you just, you pour too much love in and then you're like wait I can't love something that much or I can't let other people know I love something that much so then you just don't want to talk about it but now I have to talk about it so 100 years of solitude is definitely 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 um the best book I've read in 2020 so far I really do not I don't think anything else is going to top it this is one of the best books it might be the best book I've ever read in my life I don't know I can't say that yet just uh, uh, I'm absolutely so in love with it. Uh, how do I even describe it? It's magical realism. We're following the Buendia family through basically a hundred... I'm not gonna spoil anything. I'm not gonna say anything. But we're following the Buendia family and their troubles, their trials, their tribulations, their tragedies, and basically just the overwhelming fact that they cannot seem to get out of this circular repetition of everything they've already gone through in their lives, whether it's a father or a grandfather or a grandson, great-grandson, whatever. So many characters in this book. This book is such a complicated reading experience and it's just so rewarding. Um, realistically, there should be, I've said this before, I have on every page because just every single thing he writes, not only is his writing so beautiful, but the plot is so beautiful, the ideas, the history that's wound into here, the genre, the magical reading, realism, the characters, I've already said, this is literally a book where every aspect of the novel is 100%, which is so rare to find and also part of the reason why it's just so mind-boggling. Um, I guess I should say a little bit of information about it. This was written by Marquez, the Colombian, very famous celebrated Colombian author, and I think 1967. Let me double check that for you. 1967, look at me. Since then, I, it's just, uh, mm -hmm. I don't really have that many more things to say about it. Like I said, a whole video will be coming about this book because, whew. okay, maybe I'll just read you this one part about Rebecca, who's like, is she my favorite character in here? She might be. Um, because this is great. This is gonna like, this is, this is gonna be no context whatsoever and it's probably gonna be really confusing. Okay. On rainy afternoons, embroidering with a group of friends on the begonia porch, she would lose the thread of the conversation and a tear of nostalgia would salt her palate when she saw the strips of damp earth and the piles of mud that the earthworms had pushed up in the garden. Those secret tastes, defeated in the past by oranges and rhubarb, broke out into an irrepressible urge when she began to weep. She went back to eating earth. Yeah, she eats the mud, guys. She Little by little, she was getting back her ancestral appetite, the taste of primary minerals, the unbridled satisfaction of what was the original food. Anyway, that was a very weird part to read you guys, but I just, mm, every single, every, okay. I'm gonna stop talking about it. I can't talk about it. I have like an inability to talk about 100 Years of Solitude, which says a lot about it and it's a lot of good things, don't worry. So favorite book of the year. I will give an honorable mention to two other books that I just loved. Also five stars. That's obviously like 10 billion stars. The first one is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. I know. I read it for the first time in 2020. Also give an honorable mention to one more book, which was also five stars. Um, uh, it's After Dark by Haruki Murakami. Uh, I read this uh, two weeks ago, maybe. I think I finished it. A week and a half, maybe. And 
amazing. This is also magical realism. 2020 is just the year where I'm really delving into all of the magical realism in my life and I'm just, yes. This is a book all set during one night from I believe almost midnight to around 6 a.m. 6.52 a.m. if we're being specific because we're following encounters set between very lonely particular people um, all during the dark hours in Tokyo and it is just so wholesome. I can't describe to you. I'll talk about this book for another question later on too, but just Murakami, first of all, love him. This might, it is one of my favorite Murakami books now, but it's one that's just filled with like so much, I don't know, it describes it on the back as like phosphorescence, which I totally agree with, but more than that, there's just so much also solitude in After Dark as well. It deals a lot with the way the nighttime functions and the way spaces during the night open up and new spaces are created, this new temporality. It's very, it's a very exciting book to read. It makes you see magic everywhere in your own life, especially during the nighttime. It's a book that offers you companionship for being lonely, which is like a very specific feeling to have. And anyway, this one was five stars as well. Absolutely loved it. Um, <laughs> I loved it so much. I also thought it would be cool to kind of compare and contrast with last year's answers. Um, last year at this point, my favorite book of the year so far was The Mysteries of Adolfo by Anne Radcliffe. These books I've mentioned in comparison are like so much higher than Anne Radcliffe. This year I've had such a better reading year already and yeah. Anyway, let's move on to the second question. The second question is the best sequel you've read so far in 2020. Um, I have read actually a lot of sequels but the one I have here with me is Gemina by J. Christoph and Amy Kaufman. This is the young adult sci-fi series. This is the sequel to Illuminae. Uh, the series is the Illuminae Files. This has been out for a while but once again this is a series that I had never gotten around to. Um, and I ended up loving it so much. If you haven't seen Illuminae, it's all told in like multi-media formats. I listened to this with the audiobook production, which I always, always just have to compliment again because it's so thoroughly well done. Um, basically, in this one, we're following a whole different cast of characters, even though our characters from Illuminae, the first one, are still in here. And it's just... It's, there's so many good things going on in this book. We have like very strange sci-fi quantum mechanics um, what is it? Not string theory. Parallel universe, multiverse, the theory of the multiverse. Um, that's going on. We have these weird space, very scary creatures whose, like, slime they produce also, um, is able to generate, like, very hallucinogenic drugs. We just have so much going on. Our characters in here, Hannah and Nicholas and Ella and Jackson and what is his name? The really bad guy. He's like Hans Gruber. Fox? Maybe Fox, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's gotta be Gemini because Gemini was so good. I will give an honorable mention to The Vanishing Stair by Maureen Johnson, which I'll talk about more in a second, but definitely Gemini has got to be my favorite sequel. Yeah, so speaking of Maureen Johnson, the next question, question number three, is this a uh, new release that you haven't read yet, but that you want to? For me, that's gotta probably be The Hand on the Wall. This came out in like January, but I only started um, the Truly Devious series by Maureen Johnson a few months ago. Since then, I've read Truly Devious and The Vanishing Stare, and I am now ready to get my hands on The Hand on the Wall, which is the third one. This is a young adult murder mystery. It's also kind of dark academia but not really. I say this every time. We're, we're kind of following a, a double murder mystery, one set in the past in the 1930s um, and one set in the present. There's lots of murder going on actually. Murder everywhere. It's a really really well done murder mystery actually. I, when I read the first one I wasn't too sure how special or complicated or unique or tricky the book was actually going to be but as you keep reading the series it gets so much better and that's why I'm so excited to read The Hand on the Wall. We're following Stevie who is our true crime. Basically just everything true crime is her world, that's her life. So she is brought to Ellingham Academy which is a very prestigious pretentious school where kind of teens of very high caliber abilities endowed with a lot of specificity are admitted to basically study at this school. For example, we have like a YouTube star, we have a fantasy author, and he like wrote fantasy books when he was like 
13 or something. Um, anyway, we have this whole great cast of characters and it was just, it was really, really good. So the handle. Question number four is most anticipated release for the second half of the year. This one's really funny because this book comes out tomorrow and that is Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia because um, as you might have guessed from the title, it is gothic. Set in Mexico, I believe we're following this young woman who, um, I don't know if she's following this letter and then she has to stay in this very spooky mansion and then very spooky things start to happen to her. I'm a little vague on the details, I'm not gonna lie, but I've read a lot of reviews from people who had arcs of this book. The synopsis sounded amazing, so Mexican gothic is definitely the one I'm most excited for. There might be something around this book. I'm not going to say anything. Um, but it comes out tomorrow. I'm probably, I might pre-order it tonight or I might just wait till tomorrow and see if I can get my hands on it somewhere. But Mexican Gothic is definitely the one I'm most looking forward to because yes. Okay, question number five. Your biggest disappointment of 2020, guys. <laughs> Let's talk about it. I think we know what book I'm going to reach for. Oh, yeah, this is so sad. This is so, this is just so sad. This is also so sad because last year when I filmed the mid-year book tape, I can't say the damn name. This was actually my answer for my most anticipated release of 2019. I have now read it. I just finished it a couple days ago and it is now on my list of my most disappointing read of 2020. Life. Funny how things happen like that. All right, so Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. I'm sure you all know who Lee Bardugo is. I probably don't need to introduce you to her. Um, and I also would not like to introduce you to this book. I don't recommend it. That's why it's my most disappointing read. But I had such, uh, not even high hopes, but I was just very interested about this book and what it would be like. And I had this very small little burning, flickering flame within me that it was gonna be good because it is a dark academia. Come on, it even looks like a dark academia. We know this is a dark academia. We're following Alex who wakes up in a hospital bed with a strange man offering her a position to monitor the secret societies of Yale. Sounds great, but wait. She gets a free pass to Yale. That's like $40,000. And then she quickly finds out that the secret societies are, um, yeah, look at that, uh, supernatural. They can do magic. They can summon ghosts. Ghosts exist. Basically everything exists in this book and not in a good way. I have so many specific complaints about this, the writing, the plot, the characters, the idea, um, and also just like the social commentary that tries to wind its way through this book, like the little snake on the cover, does not do a good job. This whole book felt like a staging area where you never leave the staging area, like nothing ever happens, like stuff happens all over the place, but it just feels like no, nothing has real meaning. That's exactly what it feels like. The writing is so sloppy. I have so many, so, so many complaints in my last like three vlogs about it. So if you want like my really in-depth complaints about this book, I guess go watch those because we'd be here all day if I were to go over every single one of them. However, uh, you guys will also see this coming up again on Friday, June 26, um, because this is our Dark Academics Book of the Month, so we'll have a live show discussing this, so if you would like to come um, see me try to not get too heated discussing this book, come to that, but this is definitely my most disappointing book of the month, book of the year. Um, I'm just so sad about it, so sad about it, but I will also give an honorable mention to, what else, Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. Um, Neverwhere was still like a decently good book, I gave it three stars, but it was just really disappointing to me because um, I had been a really, really big fan of the Neil Gaiman books I had read previously before getting to Neverwhere, and I knew Neverwhere was a work of magical realism, so I was really excited to see what Gaiman was going to do with that, um, and it just ended up falling really, really flat, kind of the same problem with Ninth House, almost. It felt like nothing had any real meaning. It kind of felt like he had all of these ideas, and also, again, classism and like social commentary very it was better done in Neverwhere than in Ninth House, but still everything just felt very vague. It felt like a fever dream where you wake up and you kind of want to interpret that fever dream and then you get absolutely nothing out of that dream and it very quickly just fades away. That was Neverwhere. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but those were my most disappointing books of the year. Okay, you know what? Maybe I'll just fall in the flame if we, if we can forget about this mess. Alright, question number six is your biggest surprise of the year so far. <laughs> 
I have a few for this one, so let's just start naming them off. The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman. Really loved it. That's a middle grade polar fantasy. Um, Illuminae, I already talked about. Really love that one. I, that one surprised me as well because I usually just do not really click or vibe with young adult books, but Illuminae and Gemini, they read so well. They are fantastic entertainment while at the same time being very, very well put together, well constructed, and just, I, I just have to like say something about them every time because I was really blown away. I will also say Lovely War by Julie Berry because that one's kind of a romance historical fiction, um, also infused with Greek mythology. So it was kind of this really jumbled together book where I wasn't sure if it was actually going to be something I liked or not, but I, it was so good. It was so, so good. Basically, this is like Aphrodite's story. And like it is a World War I love story, multiple love stories during World War I. We have so many good characters in here. Um, but like I usually don't really go in for romance. But Lovely War, such a fresh insightful beautiful piece of work also young adult which is so surprising i had no idea this was young adult until i finished it um and looked it up because yeah amazing once again also speaking uh, also speaking of romance i will give uh, an honorable mention to the hating game by sally thorne Benjamin. oh hello at grandma's Um, where are you in the world right now? Um, yes, I, yes. Okay, I'll get dressed. Okay, bye. Okay, he hung up, that's rude. Uh, right, okay, so we're gonna have to resume this discussion when I get back. This is so specific, I have to go give strawberries to my grandma. I'll literally be back in like two seconds. Alright, I'm back. <laughs> Question 7 is my favorite new author that either have started writing books in 2020 or that I've discovered in 2020. The first one I just have to mention because 2020 was the year that I read his first book that I've ever read in my life and that is Charles Dickens. Yes, I read Great Expectations back in April and it is definitely in my top 10 favorite books of the year so far. I loved it. I love, oh, I just fell so in love with Dickens. I had no expectations. <laughs> funny. It blew me away so much. I've ordered a few more of his books now. I'm so happy. I loved it so much that I destroyed this book. Well, yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, so I definitely need to find a different copy of this book. It hurts. Definitely Charles Dickens is probably, he might be number one, just like his craft and his character and the way he writes and what he writes and the fantastical and the morbid and the creepy and the dark. Great Expectations was such a good book. I cannot recommend it enough. I cannot wait to read A Tale of Two Cities. There might be something coming surrounding that book. You may have heard another booktuber say the same thing, so watch out for that, but definitely Charles Dickens is the first one I need to mention. The second person I need to mention is probably, who do I want to say first, Kazuo Ishiguro. Oh my gosh. I read When We Were Orphans and it blew me away. I also had no expectations for that book, but he's such a subtly, delicately brilliant author. When We Were Orphans deals so much with memory. I know that's a common theme and a common thing that Ishiguro uses and works with and deals in and creates in his books and I'm so... I just can't wait to read more of his work. You guys have recommended to me The Remains of the Day so much. You guys have also recommended to me Never Let Me Go so much and An Artist of the Floating World which basically I just want to get into all of his works. I put a few of them on my wish list because I'm really considering getting a few of them because When We Were Orphans was just such a crazy amazing book so Ishiguro is another one on here and the last person I think I want to mention at least for right now is N.K. Jemisin absolutely brilliant I read the fifth season um, in May no no what am I saying I finished the fifth season last week it was incredible amazing I love 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 when people craft and create fantasies or fantasy books or whatever genre and 
they combine it with like almost literary fiction or fiction of a very high caliber like it's not just genre fiction anymore it's not fantasy for the sake of fantasy it's fantasy with so much meaning and so much going on and nk jemison just blew me away it blew me away not only was this an amazing fantasy book but the way she wrote it oh i want to talk about it so badly but i don't want to spoil anything what she wrote in it and just everything like that really blew me away i have a few others on my list of course i put the second book in the Broken Earth trilogy, which is the Obelisk Gate. I have that coming in on Libby, and I also put The City We Became on my Goodreads because I really want to read that one. I would love to get more into her contemporary uh, magical work, so N.K. Jemison as well. Question number eight is a bit of a silly one. It is who is your new favorite crush of 2020? Uh, having crushes in this economy? In Gemina, Nicholas Mal Malikov? Malikov. I read A Court of Thorns and Roses this year. Something is coming with that video. I know you guys keep seeing A Court of Mist and Fear on my bookshelf. I'm gonna make a video about it. But recent? Recent. I'm reading A Gathering of Shadows right now by V.E. Schwab and Alucard is, yeah, he would also be on that list. Let's move on. Probably Delilah Bard as well is on that list. Anyway. All right, number nine is your newest favorite character of 2020. I fell in love with almost every single character in Great Expectations, but there is one person in here who just stands out above all the rest and they became one of my favorite characters. It's not Pip. I know, it's not Pip. Um, Pip was fine. Mm. Uh, it's Estella. Estella is just so... I just... Estella, it, it's... What do I want to say about her? She's so interesting. She's just so interesting. Estella in here, a lot of people probably view her as this very malicious, malignant, moody, melodramatic miss, but she's just so interesting. I love- she seems so intelligent, so conscious, so aware of her situation, so not self-deprecating but very- not even humble but maybe just a little- there's like humility there, there's suffering, there's tragedy in her life, there's just- she's just the essential like tragic character in here I want to say. Obviously she's brought up by Mrs. Haversham, you could say Mrs. Haversham is the essential tragic character, or maybe you could say it was Pip, but just Estella, her- as a person. She just felt so well-rounded. All of Charles Dickens characters feel so well-crafted and well-rounded and human, but Estella, I feel like you could just really like reach out and just like shake her hand and I just want to give her a hug and I just related to her so much and I just, I loved her so much. I would die for Estella. Estella. I'm not gonna say what her last name is, but <laughs> there we go. Probably another new favorite character would have to come from After Dark. One of our main characters is named Mari. She is basically, I don't know, I want to say she's like the focal point of this book, but this book just feels like kind of lo-fi music or it feels like a polar- it just feels like- I don't know. This isn't a review of After Dark, so let's just focus on Mari. She is the first character to appear in here, basically. Um, she's very lonely. She has a lot of problems and troubles in her life. She's also a very complicated person. I do- I find a little bit of ties between her and Estella actually, which is interesting, not like overly overly, but just her as a person and the stuff she goes through and her mind and her like quietness. It's very interesting because she doesn't actually speak that much in After Dark. Takahashi speaks the most in After Dark, but the way she listens, she's a character who like so much is said about her by her quietness and her silence and those periods in the book where she is listening, where she is kind of a little bit like a reader and it's very interesting and I just ended up falling in love with her so much and just I also wanted to just reach in here and hug her and I just loved her so much. So Mari is another one. Um, I'm gonna say every single person in 100 Years of Solitude I found super interesting, especially the women. I would probably say Rebecca was my favorite character in here. She is the infamous dirt eating woman and I loved her. Ursula is amazing. Who else? Literally everyone. Remavios and just all of the women in here were so interesting. I will also give a few honorable mentions to Vivian who is our narrator in City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert. I will give an honorable mention to Vincent from Sleeping Giants or the Themis Files Ooh, trilogy by Sylvain Nouvelle and I will give an honorable mention to our trio from Gemina because I really fell in love with them. Alright, question number 10 is a book that made me cry. 
I have a few of these actually, which is really surprising. The first book that made me cry this year, I read all the way back in January. It was Can You Hear the Nightbird Call by Anita Rabadami. This is such a heavy, weighty, crushing book and it crushed me and I cried and it was just so heart wrenching. Did you hear that crack? That's what it did to my heart. This follows three women throughout three kind of family uh, not family periods, what am I saying? It follows three women throughout three different time periods in India's history, and not only India. We have women coming to Canada from India and who get, who get involved and wrapped up in the Air Canada Flight 1, no, Air India Flight 182 tragedy. And we have two other women as well who are living in Bangalore and New Delhi, and they get wrapped up in the tragedies that take place throughout their lives and their families lives and it was just so hard hitting touched on so many historical hugely important big issues and it was so traumatic to read so traumatic to witness and so traumatic because all of these events are based on real events as well that took place in the world's history more than making me cry and the just emotional distraughtness it fills you with it is such a well-written book so amazing so important so valuable and it really like touches on connectivity and this idea that the world is a net um, and nodes crop up all over the place where we intersect with our, other people's lives and it was just so so amazing so can you hear the night recall was the first one that made me shed a couple tears this year uh, another one I have to mention the picture of Dorian Gray made me cry because it was so beautifully written you know when you read a book and you're like I'm never gonna have this experience again I'm never gonna find a book that's as just crystalline as this one and as perfect and amazing. Anyway, Oscar Wilde, he, he did that. I cried like a baby. I literally cried because it was just so beautiful. Um, another book that made me also very sad was On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong. I just want to talk about this book for such a long time. On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong is so gorgeous and is so sad and so good also made me cry and this one doesn't really count because i'm still reading it but um i'm 50 pages through and i've already cried and that is autobiography of red by ann carson i know i know i know this is amazing the way she writes in here she will like break your whole body apart and fill it with light but it's just such a crazy experience and i have already cried because the lines. Okay, let me read you one line so you kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about. This is a love story between Heracles, or Hercules, and his tenth labor, which is killing a red monster named Garion, and it's a story of their kind of love affair. They're, I don't like saying love affair, that makes it sound so trite, but their relationship. I'll just read you this one page because I like, I, I like highlighted the whole page. Okay. He saw Heracles just about every day now. The instant of nature forming between them drained every drop from the walls of his life, leaving behind just ghosts rustling like an old map. How... How does distance look? How does distance look? How does distance look? How does distance... How does distance look is a simple, direct question. It extends from a spaceless within to the edge of what can be loved. It depends on light. How does distance look, Ann Carson? How does distance, how does distance look? How does it look? How, <sighs> yes. Okay, but it's okay. Let's move on to books that made me really happy so far in 2020. The first one I have to mention, Howl's Moving Castle by it by, well, who's this by? Diana Wynne Jones. I actually had no idea this was a book until I found it, it floating around on the space that Libby offers books to float around in on. Um, it is amazing. This was gifted to me by Rose. Thank you so much. I should also say too that autobiography is gifted to me by Ren over at Revel Reads. Um, <laughs> Because, like, both made me cry from happiness and sadness, so. But Howl's Moving Castle is one of the most charming books I've ever met. Maybe you guys know the story if you've seen the very famous movie by Studio Ghibli, and, um, mm. we're following Sophie Hatter when she gets cursed into being turned into an old woman. This is a middle grade as well. She goes in search of Howl, who is a wizard. A very handsome wizard. <gasps> Howl! I didn't even say Howl. Howl takes number one place for newest crush because it's Howl. He is a wizard. Everyone's scared of him. Him, they think that he eats the hearts of young girls. 
and he ate my heart. Um, and it was just so charming. Such a magical, quirky, odd, fun, amazing, um, bubbly little book. I would describe this book as like polka dots. Just your whole life will be polka dots. And it is so amazing, so beautiful, so cute. Look at this cover. Howl's Moving Castle made me probably the happiest little bean I've been in a long while. I also want to give a mention to After Dark as well for this one, but because like it wasn't really like pure happiness, like pure unbridled joy. This is kind of like you're suffering, but you're happy about it. As in like, it, it just makes you so nostalgic, so melancholic, so like full of magic, but also so sad about it. Like you're very sad, but you're like, you're happy that you're sad. It's like a very reminiscent, happy sadness. The most beautiful book I've bought this year is, ah, uh, it hurts. Cause like it's ninth house, I would say. I just really love how it looks and then, um, I do this every single time, but it has like silvery snake skin, which is just so cool. But it's just such a same shame, shame. If I had to judge the book by its cover, I would say this book is phenomenal, but the jelly in here is not the good jelly. So that's unfortunate, but at least it looks nice. And then some books that I want to read before this year's out. I'll really, really briefly mention them. We have The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, which I want to read immediately. I really, really, really want to get into the original Gothic stories, so this is one of them. I want to read The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov because um, I just, I've wanted to get into so much more magical realism and just see like what it's what other ones are like compared to 100 of Solitude, so this one. A summary read that I would love to get into very soon is A Room with a View by E.M. Forster because this is just perfect for summer. And then finally, the one that I've been meaning to read for forever and forever is Ovid's Metamorphoses because I got this new translation by Rolf Humphreys. So <laughs> this is the one I've been meaning to read for so, 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 so dang long. This is like probably number one. I think I might start reading a little bit of this per day because obviously it's quite long there's quite a lot of stories it is in verse though so that's really really nice and this is also a copy that i would like to annotate so i'm really excited to get into this but that is another one that is very high up on my tbr so i think those are finally all of the questions of the book tag definitely let me know what your guys's favorites uh, yeah, favorite book of 2020 so far. If you did the book tag, I would love to listen to it as well. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. I hope you're all doing splendidly. <laughs> Ciao.